So good morning. Welcome back to day number two. I hope everybody had a good time last night and did not drink too much beer. Before I begin, I want to thank uh, Carl and Gruner and of course George Simbruner for organizing this conference and inviting me to this fantastic city. So it was about, I think, 1975 when the mortality rate for babies who weighed less than 1,000 grams began to decrease, at least in the United States. And I remember because I was a fellow at that time, and we looked at our mortality at Columbia, and we saw that about 70% of our babies were surviving who weighed less than 1,000 grams, and the mortality rate was about 30%. And while we were excited, it was clearly not as good as we're doing now in 2012, but it was the beginning of an explosion, I think, a worldwide increase in the number of very tiny babies that occupies all of our units for extended periods of time. And it's those babies that are at great risk for healthcare associated infections. This is the term that people like to use now. We used to call it nosocomial infections or late onset infections or hospital acquired infections. And this is the newest term. And there's two facts you need to remember about healthcare associated infections. First of all, they're common. They're 20 to 100 times more common than early onset bacterial infections. Therefore, they're a much greater public health problem. And although we used to think about these kinds of infections as just nuisance infections due to organisms like coagulase negative staphylococcus, we now know that they are a major cause of morbidity and mortality. So, I, yeah, okay. so I'd like to start off with uh, a little bit of history because this is one of my heroes in medicine. It's uh, Ignaz Phyllis Semmelweis. If there's anybody from Budapest here, they all know this name. Uh, I'm not sure you know what kind of specialist he was. He was an obstetrician and uh, he's the sort of the father of hand hygiene. And back in the 1800s, he was appointed an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the local hospital in Vienna. And he was struck by the very high mortality rate, mortality rate on his ward compared to some of the leading centers um, around the world. And this is Dublin, shown over here. And this is maternal mortality in his center over here. So clearly, they were much higher. He was also struck by differences in mortality between his ward which was staffed by just physicians and the ward staffed by midwives. And here's where they separated the wards into those physicians and midwives, and the midwives' mortality went down. Physicians stayed very, very high. And the difference was that the doctors used to go down to the autopsy room and look at the women who died in childbirth. And obviously, they did autopsies and never used gloves. And then they came back up to the ward never washed their hands, did pelvic examinations of women who were about to deliver. And um, he was also saddened by one of his colleagues, whose name was Kaletka, who cut himself during one of these autopsies. And at, aut at the post-mortem, he had autopsy findings which were identical to the women who had died in childbirth. And this is what he wrote uh, about 150 years ago. He says, suddenly a thought crossed my mind Childbed fever and his friend's death, Kolechka, were one and the same. The cause must be in the fingers and hands of students soiled by recent dissections. They carry those death-dealing cadaverous poisons to the genital tract of women in childbirth. So Semmelweis was uh, a scientist, and what he did, he introduced a chlorinated lime solution to try to get people to uh, help uh, sterilize or clean off their hands and he made every member of his department who was about to examine women place their hands in this chlorinated lime solution. And I think you can see here that shortly after he did that, the mortality rate plummeted down, plummeted down from about almost 20% down to just a couple of percentages, just using hand hygiene. And his paper, which roughly reads on the etiology and understanding and prophylaxis of childbed fever, was rebuffed. He moved um, from Budapest, he moved from Vienna to Budapest, where he died in an asylum at age 47. Uh, 
This is a picture of Semmelweis University. Obviously, they named a whole university after him. And it's interesting that he died at age 47 from infection, sort of ironic. So let's talk about some of the modern strategies to reduce mortality and morbidity of infection. And there are many, and I've chose to just focus on five of these. One is to look at some of the risk factors for these healthcare associated infections and try to avoid those care practices in the, our NICUs. I'm gonna speak about the latest guidelines from the WHO and CDC about catheter maintenance and insertion. Also the latest guidelines about hand hygiene. I'm gonna speak about something that was touched upon by Dr. Martin yesterday. And what I'm gonna speak about is the use of monitoring, non-invasive monitoring to identify babies at high risk for sepsis. And this is called health rate characteristics mon monitoring or the term the company likes to use is called hero monitoring. I'm gonna speak about the basis for that. And finally, I'm gonna end with some, uh, just a brief word about prophylactic antibiotics. So why do we make a big deal about healthcare associated infections? I think about the four M's, money, mortality, morbidity, and mental deficiency. This is just an estimate from the US, but there are thought to be 100,000 deaths in the US. This is now adult and pediatric from healthcare associated infections. The cost is in billions of dollars in the US and worldwide, it's probably in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And in terms of what physicians get reimbursed, this is a big issue because in the United States, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid no longer reimburses a hospital for expenses occurred following a catheter-related bloodstream infection. They call those never events, just like a patient shouldn't fall out of bed. And if you have a patient who's got one of these infections, they say, that's your problem. We're not going to reimburse you or the hospital. As I said, these are not trivial infections. The estimates from the NIH say that about half of all deaths in newborn babies in the NICU are due to these healthcare associated infections. They are associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcome, I'll show you in a second, and they are common. So I'm gonna show you, these are both our national data and the international data for central line associated bloodstream infections, for umbilical catheter infections, and for ventilator associated pneumonia. The black numbers, here are different birth weight categories, but the black numbers are from our national healthcare um, uh, network, which records all the infections which are occurring in level three NICUs around the United States. Both again for the catheter associated infections, umbilical infections, catheter infections, and ventilator associated pneumonia. And the blue in the parentheses is from international data from INIC, International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium. And that's composed of centers around the world, including here in Belgium, in Europe, in Africa, Middle East, and in Asia. Now putting that on for comparison, if you look at the US data, it sort of makes sense to me that babies who are tinier, for example, less than 750, have a higher risk of central line associated bloodstream infections. And it goes down as you reach the more mature babies. And that's because tinier babies have are sicker and have more immunodeficiencies that predispose them to these kinds of infections. But if you look at the international data, and we have it for ventilator associated pneumonia and the central line associated bloodstream infections, the numbers don't, first of all, the much higher, again, but it's both developed countries and undeveloped countries, the numbers don't change very much from the tiniest babies to the bigger babies. That tells me that there's variables outside of sicker babies and immunodeficiency, which are contributing to the risk of these healthcare associated infections in the international community. And when the INIC has looked at hand hygiene compliance among the centers that comprise their database, it was only 54%. So again, this is a lesson that Semmelweis, Semmelweis tried to teach us that's been forgotten and that we need uh, to relearn. This is a slide which looks at the cost of these healthcare associated infections. It was actually, when written, they called it nosocomial infections. And the graph on the left looks at mean costs 
in different birth weight categories from the lowest birth weights, 4.1 to 750, up to 1251 to 1500. Babies with infection are shown in yellow. <coughs> Babies with no infection are shown in light blue. And you see two sets of bars at each birth weight category. Observed and adjusted means adjusted is adjusted for all other kinds of confounding variables. But it's pretty easy to see that in every birth weight category, having an infection certainly increases the mean cost of that hospitalization. The actual numbers are shown in these on the right-hand part of the slide. And in every birth weight category, having a uh, health, healthcare associated infection increases the cost of hospitalization <laughs> in the United States by about $30,000. And by the way, these are 1999 data uh, published in about 2004. So the numbers are gonna be even greater than that now. And as you might imagine, the cost varies with the kind of pathogen. So the mean cost, if you have a coagulase negative staphylococcal infection is about $100,000. If you have an other kinds of bacteria, for example, gram negative, it's about 120. And if it's fungal infection, it goes up to a be about $130,000. And as I mentioned, it's also associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcome. And these are data from Barbara Stoll from the NICHD. There's been some other recent reports from other countries looking at similar issues, looking at the, the two-year follow-up of babies who've had a healthcare-associated infection. We're looking at mental developmental index less than 70, psychomotor development index less than 70, cerebral palsy and microcephaly, and everything you see in blue is statistically significant. Clinical infection is increased. Uh, the, these outcomes are increased with clinical infection. Certainly they're increased with sepsis, and they're even increased further in babies who have necrotizing enterocolitis, even without a positive infection. So let's uh, turn and speak a little bit about the, the epidemiology. And I would guess the kinds of pathogens causing sepsis in your nurseries, at least the healthcare associated infections are pretty similar. These are data from four different centers um, in the United States and, and in Israel, looking at the common pathogens responsible for these healthcare associated infections. And in general, coagulase negative staphylococci are responsible for a half or more of these infections, followed by the gram negative enterics, and there's a wide variety responsible, and, and the incidence varies across the world. But fungal infections are pretty stable. They're about 11 to 12 percent of all uh, infections. Now, one of the problems we all have is when we get a positive culture for coagulase negative staphylococcus, we say, is it a contaminant? Is it really causing infection? And this is an algorithm that we uh, put together that's been published uh, actually by the Academy of Pediatrics now, looking at how you interpret the uh, positive culture for coagulase negative staphylococcus. So in a sick baby, our recommendation is you draw, if possible, a peripheral and a central blood culture. Central blood culture is coming from a indwelling central line, peripheral blood culture from a peripheral vein. And the way we interpret and then begin antibiotics, obviously symptomatic baby we all treat, and this is how we interpret it. If our cultures are both negative from peripheral and central, obviously that's a baby who's displaying signs and symptoms for some other reason and is not bacteremic. If the peripheral is positive but our central is negative, we presume that's just lying contamination. So we say that baby probably was not bacteremic with that organism. On the other hand, if the peripheral is negative and the central line is positive, we call that a central line colonization. The difference is when we treat central line colonization, we'll treat it just for a few days until the central line is sterilized, but not for seven to 10 days. And obviously, if both cultures are positive, peripherally and centrally, we call that true coagulase negative staphylococcal bacteremia. There's been a zillion studies looking at epidemiology, and what you see on this slide and the next slide are the variables which come out as risk factors for infection. Obviously, being a premature baby, low birth weight, low gestation is a major risk factor for infection. The use of parental alimentation and central lines, postnatal steroids, which I hope you're not using very commonly in your nursery, are also associated with increased risk of infection. 
Histamine blockers we, like Zantac um, are, are associated with an increased risk of infection in lots and lots of studies, not just bacterial infection, but also fungal infections in babies. From an experimental investigational viewpoint, babies with lower levels of IgG are increasingly susceptible. Obviously, infants that are on a ventilator for a long time, overcrowded NICUs, heavy workloads, staffing problems and inexperienced nurses has been picked out as a risk factor. But I want to point out that I don't think nurses uh, are the problem. This is a data, it was one of these survey data from the UK looking at, I think, a hundred and some hospitals across the United Kingdom, looking at nosocomial bacteremia. And they looked at three variables, patient volume, consultant availability, and the number of nurses to see uh, which of those were associated with a high risk of infection, medium risk, or low risk. So obviously, in NICUs with more patients, probably sicker patients, the risk of nosocomial bacteremia is higher. Nurses, in fact, was not a significant variable, but the number of consultants was a significant variable. And my question to you, why is the number of consultants a, an important variable? It's pretty easy, because doctors don't wash their hands. I mean, we we'll get we think that's funny, and I think it's, it's a problem, and I think it's getting uh, better, but it's, it's a big, nurses tend to wash their hands or have better compliance with hand hygiene than do physicians. So I'd like to look at the 2011-2012 guidelines for prevention of catheter-related infections. But before I, oops, before I do that, I'm going to point out some other variables which are not included in the guideline, which are important determinants of whether a baby gets an infection or not. The first being the kinds of catheters that are used Silastic catheters are more prone to catheter-associated infections than polyurethane catheters, which we use. Any catheter which has a rough surface to it, and there are big differences in how well the catheters are finished, uh, bacteria tend to stick to those small irregularities. There are host factors. As you know, once a catheter is inserted, it becomes uh, covered or by all kinds of proteins in the blood and certain kinds of bacteria adhere to fibrin or fibronectin that form a sheath around the catheter. And then there are intrinsic virulence factors. There are certain kinds of bacteria which form what we call slime or biofilm or glycocalyx, and those kinds of bacteria in, uh, include the most common cause of bacteremia, coagulase negative staphylococci, but also staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Candida all produce this slime later, which makes it harder for the white cells in the body to get to the bacteria to kill it. So I'm going to show you recommendations, and this is the standard way of thinking about recommendations. Category 1A is strongly recommended based on well-designed experimental clinical epidemiologic studies. Category B is also strongly recommended, but the strength of the evidence is slightly weaker, and it could be a strong theoretical rationale. 1C is required by state or federal regulations. Uh, category 2 is suggested by clinical or epidemiologic studies and a theoret or theoretical rationale, but the data are weaker. It could be a consensus panel of experts recommending things. And finally, there may be a recommendation that the data are insufficient. So these are um, the recommendations that were published by, the, um, by a committee put together composed of about 10 infection control organizations in, in the United States. They were published in Clinical Infectious Disease in 2011, and the strength of each of the recommendations is shown in the parentheses at the top here, performing hand hygiene. I'm surprised it's not a 1A recommendation, but the strength is not as strong as 1A, but it's clearly 1B. Whenever you insert a catheter, as you know, you need to use maximal sterile barrier um, precautions, which means a, a sterile gown, a cap, mask, and sterile gloves, and then a prep on the site that you're in, putting in the catheter. Now, the kind of preparation we use to sterilize a site is controversial. The official recommendation is use povidone iodine. It's a 1B recommendation in babies less than two months of old, who are less than two months old. But there's lots of data from the adult literature 
that 2% chlorhexidine is much better than povidine iodine for reducing the risk of catheter-related bloodstream infections. And in fact, across our country, and I'm guessing across the world, people are moving more and more away from povidine iodine. We use it when we insert umbilical catheters, but not when we insert central lines. And we use uh, something called chloroprep, which is a combination of uh, chlorhexidine plus alcohol. So for, except for umbilical catheter insertion nowadays, even in tiny babies, we're using the chlorhexidine preparation. Obviously, sterile gloves, whenever you um, insert a catheter, and for all dressing changes. The recommendation is never use a topical antibiotic or cream, and the reason for that, as soon as you put a cream at the site of catheter insertion, it makes that catheter move in and out. And every time it moves in and out, it's likely to draw bacteria into the site and predispose to the risk of infection. There's a recommendation for how often the catheter should be changed. If you're using, if you're giving blood or lipid emulsions, the recommendation is to replace that tubing every 24 hours. That's a 1B recommendation. On the other hand, if you're not giving blood or lipid, then the recommendation is to change it not more often than every 96 hours, but at least every seven days. Uh, some people try to use replacement of central venous catheters when babies are uh, bacteremic, and that does not work. There are a variety of um, dressings that can be used. We tend to use transparent dressings in New York so our nurses can monitor the site. If there is blood that's oozing, sometimes we use a gauze dressing for a day or, a day or two uh, until the bleeding is stopped. The recommendation is that you replace the transparent dressings about every seven days, but they point out that that is not necessarily the recommendation for newborn babies where there's a risk of catheter dislodgement. Gauze dressings, which we get rid of, usually not more than a day or two. Our nurses monitor the catheter site visually on every shift, so every 12 hours they're looking at it and making sure there's no evidence of infection there. And any dressing which looks damp or loose or soiled obviously gets replaced. There are new recommendations for umbilical catheters and venous catheters. They're recommending povidone iodine uh, before insertion. It's different than tincture of iodine. Remember, tincture of iodine it, uh, can suppress thyroid function in babies. Povidine iodine does not. And we do use that for umbilical catheter insertion. We use uh, heparin in all of our central lines and umbilical catheters at a concentration of one unit per ml. We, again, we do not use topical antibiotics or creams uh, because they allow the catheter to move in and out. Very important, when a catheter is no longer needed or there's any vascular insufficiency, the catheter is removed uh, almost immediately. And in general, we tend um, to use, not use umbilical venous catheters for more than a day or two. We try to replace them with percutaneous central lines. But they say that umbilical arterial lines should not be left in place for more than five days. There's a little data to support that. It's a level two recommendation. And for umbilical venous catheters, no more than every 14 uh, days. The site of catheter emplacement is, a, is, again, a more of an issue in the adult literature. People look at the incidence of infection with femoral lines versus lines put into the subclavian or to an, an extremity. And in the pediatric population, including babies, there's no evidence that the site of catheter placement has any greater risk in terms of uh, catheter-related bloodstream infections. And as far as tunneled catheters, like we call them Broviac catheters or non-tunneled catheters, again, no difference in the pediatric population. Now, when it comes to hand hygiene, you have to remember that there are three kinds of flora that all of us have from time to time. There's transient flora, which sit very, very superficially on the skin floor. So if we shake hands with somebody or we touch the baby's skin, the floor can be shed from that interaction and go onto our skin, again, very superficially. There's resident floor, which lasts a long time and is usually found deeper, and occasionally there'll be infectious floor if the baby has a pustule. Most of the nosocomial or healthcare-associated infections are caused by these transient floor, which are, again, located very superficially, and that's why hand hygiene techniques that de-germ are effective in getting rid of the transient floor. 
So there's two alternatives that people have used throughout the years. I would guess that most of you are using these alcohol-based formulations. Uh, there's a zillion of them on the market. We use what's something called Purell in the United States, but again, there's a lot of alternatives. These are emollients um, that are, that are uh, combined with alcohol. You can put it on, you wait for 10 seconds, and you, the bacteria, at least on the very surface, are killed off, so they're very effective. For years, we used soaps and detergents, and what people have found out is that any anionic or cationic detergent, detergent is very damaging to the skin. So if you're seeing 30 babies in the morning and you're washing your hands with uh, chlorhexidine or some sort of detergent wash, at the end, I'm sure your hands are burning and red. And we know that bacteria tend to stick uh, to areas of the skin that are damaged. This is actually promoting colonization. And these are the latest recommendations from the World Health Organization. These are the recommendations that we follow in the United States and are supported by the CDC. And basically they say, if your hands are dirty, you have material on them, they're soiled, then you gotta wash them with soap and water to get rid of that, ma that material. For all other antiseptic, Sepsis, they recommend these alcohol-based hand rubs with emollients because they do not damage the skin and they're very effective. If you don't have that in your nursery, in some, uh, in some developing countries, they're not available. Again, recommendation is for soap and water. They used to recommend using brushes like surgeons use and scrubbing up to our elbows for several minutes. Brushings are, a brush is no longer recommended at all because it damages the skin. And again, damaged skin harbors more bacteria, uh, both for men and women, not to use artificial nails or ex extenders. Um, we had an epidemic, which we actually reported in, in New England Journal of Medicine, of pseudomonas infection in our NICU from a nurse who had artificial nails, and the artificial nails were harboring or colonized with pseudomonas. With a, they recommended uh, short nails, no dark nail polish, clear nail polish is, an acceptable, is acceptable for anybody who wants to wear it. Decontaminate your hands bef before and uh, after removal of sterile gloves. So sterile gloves are important sometimes for patient contact, but again, when you take them off, you have to go through a hand hygiene process. If your hand comes in contact with any of the patient's skin, or body fluids, or mucous membranes, or excretions. Again, hand hygiene is important. Something that we often forget because everybody's tired making rounds, they will go to the bedside, and somebody leans on the isolate because they've been up all night or tired. Anytime you're touching the environment, you're probably, it's important just to take 10 seconds to sterilize your hand. And the recommendation is not to use soap and water and these hand hygiene emollients concurrently because the effectiveness of the emollients is decreased by uh, soap. Wear gloves when it's reasonably anticipated that you're gonna have contact with blood or other kinds of infectious material. Monitor hand healthcare, healthcare worker hand hygiene practices. This is actually really important. In my NICU, I'll show you data in a second, we used to have very poor compliance with hand hygiene until they put secret observers in my NICU. Nobody knew who the secret observers were. I think they were medical students getting paid, but they came and watched who was doing hand hygiene and, and wrote it down when you were not doing it. And over a period of months, our hand hygiene went up to, and it's now on average about 95% or greater. And lastly, you ought to have the opportunity for hand hygiene at every bedside, not just at a sink. But compliance with hand hygiene um, is poor, unfortunately. And this is one of my favorite studies, and if any of you are vegetarians, this study should appeal for you, because they took DNA from cauliflower at where they could measure it using PCR and use it as a marker for microbial transmission, and they put it on the telephone handle of one of six NICU pods, and each NICU pod housed eight babies, and they took samples over seven days to see how that cauliflower DNA spread. And we're looking at now percent positive samples um, over a period of zero to 48 hours, uh, looking at within the same pod uh, 
of the hands of healthcare workers at the bedside, charts, equipment, and even doors all became rapidly colonized because people were not washing their hands. And this looks at the spread of that cauliflower DNA around the NICU to nurses station. Here's where doctors were having their rest area. They're up about 100% within four hours. Again, because they're not washing their hands. Break rooms and locker rooms all became quickly colonized, unfortunately. And this is data, it's a little old data now, looking at what happened when we had secret observers in our NICU, and I, we went from about 50% compliance over here to close to 90%, but I can tell you now that month after month where we monitor that, and we do monitor it in our NICU, our compliance is about uh, close to 100%. So even when the head of pediatric surgery walks into my NICU and says, I'm gonna to touch the baby, and doesn't wash their hands, our nurses will throw themselves in front of the baby and say, no, you're not. You go wash your hands, and then you come back, and then I'll let you touch the baby. So I think that's the right thing to do. So let's talk a little about diagnosis. And as you know, if you have a baby who's symptomatic in your NICU, you get a blood culture. When we talk about healthcare-associated infections, we usually get a urine culture. You're gonna hear me say later on this, this afternoon that with early onset sepsis, we do not get urine cultures. We commonly get a white blood count and differential count. Often we get CRP, C-reactive protein. Some of you may be using procalcitonin. If the baby looks really ill, we'll think about doing a lumbar puncture on the baby when they're clinically stable. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about cytokine determinations and health rate characteristics monitoring. So when I used to talk about diagnosis of sepsis, I used to say cytokines, they're in the future, Nobody cares about cytokines now because we can't even measure them accurately. And this is a study from 2006 looking at interleukin-6 and healthcare-associated infections. They called them late-onset sepsis. Looking at babies with proven sepsis, clinical sepsis or controls. Looking at time zero when the diagnosis was made and after 48 hours, making the point that this is just one cytokine that with with uh, healthcare associated infections, there is cytokinemia. There's an increased elevation of IL-6, but it returns to baseline. Look how quickly it comes down, very, very quickly. So it's an early marker of late onset sepsis. And this is a more recent study where they've looked at a whole variety of cytokines. I hope you can see this, interleukin-6, TNF, alpha, GCSF, IL-8, IL-10, IL-1 receptor antagonists, and a chemokine shown over here, and looked at how they differ from various kinds of pathogens. SRO stands for sepsis ruled out. CS is clinical sepsis. The green bars are about gram positives, and the tan bars shown over here are yellow bars, are gram negatives. And you can see, pretty easy to see, that the cytokine elevations do vary with the kind of pathogen, and they are higher for gram negative infections versus gram positive infections. And this is a hierarchical cluster map from the same paper, looking at levels of various cytokines, GCSF, IL-10, again, IL-1 receptor antagonist, IL-6, IL-8, IP-10, and TNF-alpha. And over here are all the gram negatives. The deeper the red color, the higher the cytokine levels. The green color are all these coagulase, negative staphylococci. They see that the levels of cytokines in, with some pathogens, for example, coagulase negative staphylococcus, are much lower than we would see either with our gram negatives or staphylococcus aureus. So I told George I was going to show you some old data of his, but it's really important data. So Kuster and Simbruner wrote this paper in Lancet. I can't believe it's uh, 14 years ago. It seems like yesterday, but it's, it was a this paper is a key paper in that led to what I'm going to tell you about, hero monitoring or heart rate characteristics monitoring. And uh, George told me yesterday when Kuster came to him, he said, don't measure white counts or C-reactive protein. Think of something that's going to be unique, that's going to be a predictor of infection. So they measured, so they measured CRP, but they also looked at IL-6 and IL-1 receptor antagonists for the three days preceding a symptomatic infection in babies, and then one day afterwards. And here's C-reactive protein, sort of on the day before infection, CRPs went up. 
But look at the cytokine elevations, these two cytokines, which preceded any clinically symptomatic infection in the babies in that nursery. And I think it was a, a, I call it a landmark paper, and led to this notion of heart rate monitoring and late onset sepsis. So you all know from fetal monitoring that beat to beat variability is one of the signs of fetal well being. And in every human being, in all of us, the interval between our heart rates, the beat to beat variability is changing constantly. The heart is regulated through the autonomic nervous system, which then attaches to the sinoatrial cells. And within the autonomic nervous system, there's two parts, as you know, sympathetic nerve endings and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the centers in the brain which control heart rate variability are all located in the med medulla, uh, the nucleus ambiguous, the solitary nucleus, and the dorsal medial nucleus. And that's where all the autonomic fibers originate. All the presynaptic fibers release acetylcholine. Within the sympathetic nervous system, the postsynaptic fibers release norepinephrine. And within the parasympathetic nervous system, they release acetylcholine. In general, sympathetic fibers increase heart rate, and the parasympathetic fibers decrease heart rate. And as you know, the autonomic nervous system has a lot of innervations in a, a wide variety of organs. On this little diagram, here's the medulla up here. The parasympathetic nervous system runs in the vagus nerve. And again, parasympathetic tends to slow the heart rate. The sympathetic nervous system comes out through the spinal cord, spinal cord in the first four thoracic roots and then innervates the heart. And the sympathetic nervous system tends to increase uh, the heart rate. There are really interesting interactions that have been described over the last several years between inflammation and brain and the heart. So when we have an inflammatory site in the body, those cytokines and other mediators see, send signals up to the brain stem where the centers that control heart rate variability are located. And the response to sepsis, and you're gonna, I'm gonna show you this over again, is decreased heart rate variability and increased numbers of decelerations in heart rate. But there's also another very interesting interaction, and it's shown in the red little arrow over here, that the brain, through the vagus nerve and sympathetic fibers, can have great effects on the inflammatory response itself. So not only does the inflammation affect the brain, but if the brain also affects inflammation. And that is, look, this is a, um, a drawing by Karen Failchard in Virginia, who has done a lot of this research, one of my former fellows, showing some of these interactions, showing that the sympathetic nervous system, adrenergic, increases heart rate, the parasympathetic nervous system decreases heart rate, but the cholinergic, through the vagus nerve, actually is anti-inflammatory, decreases inflammation, and adrenergic nervous system through the coming out from the first th four thoracic segments actually can either increase or decrease inflammation. So the two char characteristics that people are monitoring now are decreased heart rate variability and repetitive heart rate transient decelerations. So this looks, should look pretty familiar to you. It's a monitor, it's looking at normal heart rate variability. If this were a fetal monitor, we say the fetus is doing well. This is actually postnatal monitoring. And in babies with sepsis, there are changes. The amount of variability goes down, pretty obviously, and you get these transient decelerations. The problem is, if you're looking at a monitor, you will not pick up these transient decelerations. They occur very briefly, they go away, and the monitor is not gonna say the baby is bradycardic. So how does sepsis work to do this? And some of that, again, is from work from Karen Fairchild, where she implants a transmitter in a mouse and then challenges that mouse with, uh, here she's challenging it with endotoxin and it's looking at beat to beat variability. So standard deviation of the RR interval, this is what it represents. You're using three doses of endotoxin or control. And you can see here pretty quickly, when I say pretty quickly, it's usually within two to four hours, you start to get a decrease in beat to beat variability when the uh, mouse, in this case, is challenged with end endotoxin. And if you give one of the cytokines like TNF-alpha, again, 
TNF alpha decreases B to B variability pretty quickly within about four to six hours after administering it intraperitoneally. And here is the same mouse model, only this time using challenge with whole microorganisms, either Klebsiella or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So here is the control or baseline. Here's where 10 minutes after the path pathogen was administered, and again, the heart becomes very, very regular. What you don't see is there are also some decelerations, but you can block that response by giving atropine, again, restoring it to baseline, showing that a lot of these changes in response to endotoxin or response to bacteria or cytokines is mediated through the vagus nerve. This is what a heart rate characteristic monitor looks like. This is at the bedside, and by the way, these are not an advertisement, but these are now commercially available uh, in the United States and I think through a lot of the um, world also. So this is looking a little hard to see. This is looking at a composite of three variables, what I'll show you in a second. And what you're seeing here is an elevation, and that elevation tells you that that baby may be at risk for sepsis. And what it's recording is decreased variability and these transient decelerations. And the three variables, and it's a complex algorithm, mathematical formula, are looking at three things. They're looking at the standard deviation of the R to R interval, looking at something called asymmetry and entropy and calculating these three variables, again, which are looking through these transient decelerations and decreased variability, and giving you a quantitative number which can tell you the risk of bacterial sepsis in that baby. So here's an, just an illustration of here a, from a human newborn infant, normal variability. Here's where we're getting transient deceleration, so the risk of sepsis is going up. This is the heart rate characteristic score, and then after treatment with antibiotics, it comes back down to normal. So you ask yourself, is it really any better than just taking a careful look at the baby? Well, I'll go back to the um, article by Kuster and Sumbrunner, which said the cytokines actually go up before the baby becomes clinically symptomatic. And here we're looking at a clinical score, clinical score shown in the blue circles versus this heart rate characteristics index shown in the red squares over here. And you can see that the heart rate, these are all statistically significant, heart rate characteristics index begins to increase before that infant becomes clinically symptomatic and it has obviously developed a healthcare associated infection. I don't want to minimize physical examination. This is from a study by Griffin published in Pediatric Research in 2007 where they said, asked the same question, is clinical score more important or heart rate characteristics monitoring more important? And in fact, they're both important. So in terms of estimating risk of sepsis, sepsis, if you look at the clinical score, and here's a numerical score they developed, they say the risk of sepsis is three. If you're just looking at just heart rate characteristics, it's more than two. But if you combine them, you get a, they're additive to one another. The clinical score and the heart rate characteristics index can help you identify the babies who are infected at the earliest possible time point. The higher the heart rate characteristic score, the greater the risk of sepsis. And we're looking at fold increase in sepsis, and we're looking at percentiles of heart rate characteristic scores. And again, if you're in the highest percentile for a heart rate characteristic score, the greatest likelihood up to a five-fold increase in sepsis in, that, in a given baby. And they've compared it, the heart rate characteristic monitoring, to other kinds of things that we think about, eye to ratios, apnea, increased ventilator requirements, hyperglycemia, thrombocytopenia, abnormal white blood count. And here we're looking at the performance in terms of risk for sepsis. Here's our odds ratios. And again, compared to all these variables, heart rate characteristic monitoring is better in terms of predicting the likelihood of sepsis. There's only been one study that's been published, and uh, Dr. Martin referred to it yesterday. It's by Mormon. It's one of the group at uh, University of Virginia. And in this study, they had two groups of babies, one in whom the, they looked at the heart rate characteristics monitoring, and the other, it was masked. They, the care providers could not see it. They had about 3,000 babies in the study. The primary outcome was the number of days the babies were alive and ventilator-free, 
after 120 days of randomization. And as it turns out, between the two groups, the group that had it masked or they were looking at it, there was a 2.3 day difference, not very impressive, in the primary outcome, again, alive and ventilator free. The mortality rate was decreased in the babies who had heart rate characteristic monitoring from 10 down to 8, and that p value was 0.04. The number needed to monitor or number needed to treat is 48, and the benefits were greatest in babies who weighed less than 1,000 grams. And let me end just by speaking about fluconazole prophylaxis. We do not use fluconazole prophylaxis in our nursery. We are part of a large multi-center trial to investigate whether this is safe and effective. There's a lot of data pointing out its effectiveness. Candida is still a big problem in the United States with more than 1,200 cases, 1,200 survivors and two to 3,000 cases every year uh, and two to 300 deaths. Um, and some people have recommended targeting babies that are at highest risk for candida, which means babies less than 1,000 grams, less than 27 weeks. In 2006, about a third of all the neonatologists in the U.S. were using it. Uh, because our risk of candida is so low, we have decided not to use it in my NICU. And the whole idea is to begin fluconazole shortly after birth to prevent colonization. Once babies are colonized, it's not clear that fluconazole prophylaxis will have any benefit in terms of decreasing the risk of a fungal infection. It really decreases colonization. And here's a Cochrane analysis looking at the, uh, the outcome as invasive fungal infection from the four biggest studies shown over here, done in the US and in Europe. Here's the combined um, relative risk, which is 0.23 in confidence intervals. Um, from the studies published up until this point, it did not decrease death prior to discharge, but was approaching statistical significance. So I'd like to end what I think are common sense strategies to prevent these healthcare associated infections. One, avoid care practices which bypass normal skin mechanisms. So we all know about central lines and catheters, but try to avoid doing heel sticks on babies. Every time you do a heel stick in a baby, you're increasing that baby's risk of bacteremia. Limit drugs which are associated with these infections, steroids for chronic lung disease or H2 blockers, if you have a baby with a resistant or invasive microorganism, microorganism like MRSA or uh, ESBL, ESBL Klebsiella, use gloves and a gown when touching that baby. Limit the use of antibiotics and when needed, use the simplest and most appropriate antibiotic. We're all seduced by the third and fourth and fifth generation antibiotics, but sometimes antibiotics like penicillin are the best antibiotic for the baby. Use, I think, the alcohol-based emollients. They're not better than other ways of hand hygiene, but they do improve compliance. People are much more likely to clean their hands with the emollients than go to a sink. Do not use brushes. Try to avoid skin damage. Breastfeeding, clearly important. Minimize the number of central venous catheter days, which means try to get the catheter out at the earliest possible time point. So when our babies reach a volume of 100 ml per kilogram per day of enteral feedings, we always remove the central lines, even though they're not on full caloric feedings. Use sterile barriers for line insertion and, and uh, line maintenance. Follow the recommendations for compliance and the, and the uh, CDC guidelines for catheter insertion and maintenance. Uh, line insertion and dressing changes about every seven days. This is part of our NICU bundle. We have a checklist for line insertion, so we're very careful to make sure that the baby is, first of all, identified properly, and it's done in a sterile fashion with a barrier using um, sterile gloves, mask, and gown. We use the chloroplep, the alcohol chlorhexidine combination after any baby older than 48 hours. Again, we remove central lines when the enteral intakes are 80 to 100 ml per kilogram per day. We try not to enter central lines, which I'm sure you do. Try to use a separate port for parental alimentation and lipids. Um, again, dressing changes every seven days. Tubing is changed every third day in my NICU. That's our protocol. This is up to 2009 data. I think we can do better than this. It's looking at our central line associated bloodstream infection rates. 
in babies of various sizes, we're better. There are some months in my NICU where not one, we have a NICU of about 70 babies, not one baby has a central line infection, but I know we can continue to do better, perhaps not completely preventing these infections. So finally, conclusions. These are big, this is a big problem worldwide. Healthcare associated infections, increased mortality and morbidity, and add hundreds of billions of dollars to NICU care. They can be prevented. There's, I didn't pre present the data to you. There's probably a dozen studies in the literature where other NICUs have adopted what they call bundles, uh, groups of practices which have clearly demonstrated that these infections can be reduced almost to zero. To zero. And I would say, if you have a lot of fungal infections in your nursery, fluconazole prophylaxis should be used, but I would wait until we uh, look at larger randomized clinical trials. And with that, I thank you, and I'll stop and answer any questions. Any questions?